Here in the camera basics section, we're going to take care of obviously some simple things, but we also have a few important things to do in here as well. We're going to be talking about what mirrorless cameras are, the different size sensors available and what's in this camera, the primary controls that we're going to be using throughout the remainder of this class, as well as setting our file format, which is one of the most important settings to do with a digital camera. All right, so this is a mirrorless camera, which means we have interchangeable lenses on this particular style. In the lenses, we have apertures, which is our first way of controlling the light that's coming in. It's the size of the opening, and we can adjust this to many different size options. And so we might have lenses that go down to 1.4, and Nikon actually has lenses that go much faster than that as well. Or you might be able to stop them down to f22. When you go from, say, an aperture of 5.6, to f4, you are letting in twice as much light or you're opening up the aperture. If you go from 5.6 to f8, you're stopping down the aperture, you're letting in half as much light as we move one stop lower on that scale. Beyond controlling the amount of light coming in to the sensor, it also controls your depth of field. So a lens that opens up to 1.4 is gonna have very shallow depth of field. And that can be very handy for certain types of photography like portrait photography where you want to blur out the background. As you stop your aperture down, you get a little bit more depth of field with each step of the aperture. When you get down to f22, for instance, you're going to end up with great depth of field. And this will vary a little bit depending on which lens you are using and the resulting angle of view. All right, light is still trying to get in to that image sensor after it goes through the lens, but it needs to get past the shutter unit. Now the shutter unit uh, often called curtains, even though they're actually metal blades these days. The uh, curtains, there's actually two parts to it. There's a first part and a second part. The first part is normally blocking the sensor with an SLR, but with a mirrorless camera, this needs to be opened up so that light can come in to hit the sensor so that you can see things either on the LCD on the back of the camera or through the electronic viewfinder. And so this is how you're going to frame up your image. Now, when it comes time to press down on the shutter release to take a photo, well, there's a lot of little actions that are going on with the shutter blades. The first step is it needs to close so that the sensor can prepare to capture the image. And then it opens to collect the light. That is your exposure time right there. And then the second shutter comes in and closes. And that stops the exposure. And then it all needs to open again so that you can see what's going on in for the next shot. And so you'll have that happen each time you take a photo. Now the shutter speeds are another great way of controlling the amount of light coming in the camera, but they also have the ability to either freeze or show motion of things that are moving around. And so that can be a very helpful tool in the world of photography. So those are your key components with a mirrorless camera. One of the most important aspects of any camera is the image sensor and the size that it is. Now there are lots of different cameras and there's lots of different sized sensors for those cameras. The ones that use interchangeable lenses, this is the largest of the most popular common sizes out there. It's based off of 35 millimeter film and it was just kind of a happy medium of size that was very convenient for photographers, and it is what has resulted in one of the most popular formats for modern cameras. Uh, there are several different sizes that are smaller, that are very good. There's a whole collection of trade-offs as you go up and down the scale of sensors. So this is known as a full-frame sensor, mainly because it is the same as 35 millimeter film. Nothing truly full about it. They're all full in some ways you might think on their own, but there are different size sensors out there and there are lenses that are designed for those particular sensors. And so this is a full frame sensor in the Z5. All right, the primary controls on this camera. Obviously, you want to have the camera turned on if you were going to be using it. Turning off saves battery power. When you do flip the switch on and off, there is a low pass filter that will vibrate to move, remove dust off of the sensor. There's a little cover in front of the actual image sensor there and dust on the sensor will show itself by being black flakes or specks especially in light co colored areas like clouds or walls or anything kind of plain and light colored in that regard and it can be a real problem and you'll have to clean off the sensor but the camera does a pretty good job at just keeping it clean on its own 
Shutter release for taking photos, obviously pretty important there. The main command dial is on the back of the camera, kind of the top back of the camera, and the sub command dial is on the front. So in general, if you have to change something, it's probably the main command. If that's being used for something else, then it might be the sub command. And so we're gonna be using the two of these to change shutter speeds and apertures, but there's a whole lot of other features throughout this class and the operation of this camera that you'll be using both of those dials. Looking onto the back of the camera, we have a photo video switch. Now this is really important because the camera operates very differently when it's in the movie mode as compared to the still mode. We'll talk more about the movie modes in the movie sections of this class. Uh, section number nine is on movies, as well as one of the sections in the menu settings as well. So we'll talk a lot about shooting movies in there. Now on the back of the camera, there is an up, down, left, right controller that is called the multi-selector. And this is gonna be used for a variety of purposes. You'll be navigating through the menu system with it, and there's a couple different menus in there for that. Uh, you can move focusing points around with it, and it's gonna be used in a lot of different ways. And so get very used to that one. In the middle of that is an OK button, and this is gonna be usually used for confirming a setting that you are making. Uh, so we saw how we were doing this before when we were resetting the camera. And so you want to confirm something, generally you're going to press the OK button. There is a sub-selector. I will probably call this the joystick because that's kind of what it's like. It's just a little rocker switch that you can move into any of eight directions, but it is also a button. And so not only do you move the focusing point with it, but if you press in on it, it can perform different functions and those can be customized and we'll talk about that later on in the class. And finally, we do have a touch screen on this camera. So if you do wanna use the touch screen, there are a lot of common gestures used on screens for magnifying images, for scrolling left and right and so forth. And so some people like to use the touch screen and some people don't. And uh, there's really nothing that you have to use the screen for. You can use a dedicated button, but if you don't like the buttons, there's probably a way to use the screen for many, many of the features of the camera. Now, Nikon has buttons that work well, a little bit differently than other cameras out there in some regards. And so the ISO button and the exposure compensation button, as well as the buttons on the front of the camera, have kind of a safety protocol where you have to hold the button in while you are turning a dial. And this way you can't just accidentally hit the button and have your camera change modes on you. Uh, it's a, as I say, it's a nice safety protocol, and this can actually be turned off if you want. If you want to dive into the custom setting menu under controls, under release button to use the dial, you can turn this particular feature off so it's, um, it works in a different manner where you just press the button and then it stays active and you can make a change with the dial and you don't have to have two fingers working the controls at the exact same time. And that might be handy for people who are holding the camera in a different manner or just don't have as easy of access to pressing the buttons on the camera. The shutter release on the camera has a lot of things going on. When you press halfway down, it turns on the metering system. It starts the autofocus so that your camera will, your lens will focus for you, but it also wakes the camera up should it be asleep. Now the cameras tend to go asleep fairly quickly in order to conserve battery power. This is something that can be controlled in the menu system as to how quickly it powers down, but generally it's a very common thing. So when you're shooting and you know you're gonna wanna take a shot pretty soon, you press down halfway on the shutter release just to wake the camera up and be ready. And if you are somehow lost in the menu system or you're just in the menu system and you want to get ready to shoot a photo, press halfway down and that will always return you to a shooting mode so that you can be ready to shoot a photo because that is the primary purpose of a camera, shooting photos. And then pressing all the way down, of course, fires the shutter release. Now, there are many photographers who do not like having the half down press of the shutter release activate the focusing system. And you can turn this off. And the reason that you might want to turn it off is if you want to do what is called back button focusing. This is where there is an AF on button on the back of the camera and you would have that as your sole way of focusing. And when you press down on the shutter release, all you're doing is taking photos. You're not triggering the focusing system at all. 
All right, one of the most important settings here is the file format. This is going to be the image quality that you are setting. When you shoot images with a digital camera, you are recording a file type onto a memory card. And we have two options, RAW and JPEG. If you are pretty serious about your work, you're going to probably want to shoot in RAW. This is the original information. Gives you the full tonal scale from darkest darks to the highest brights, and it's going to give you the most versatility for making adjustments later on, later on down the road. JPEGs are smaller in file size, and they're very convenient for posting online and sending and storing lots of images on a memory card, but they are compressing and throwing away some information. So you want to be very careful about when and where you want to use those. So let's go ahead and dive on into this section and take a look at the options in particular. So first up is RAW. This is where I recommend most people who have this camera set it because you're going to be getting the original information. You're going to be getting all 24 megapixels. It's a larger file size, 20 to 30 megabytes or so, uh, but you are getting all the best information off the camera. And at that point, you can decide what you want to do with the image and you can turn it into JPEGs and you can change it to smaller file sizes and do whatever you need with it at that point. Uh, but this way you're getting the original information. Next up are a bunch of different JPEG options. There are actually six different variations on exactly how big or small do you want these file sizes, how much information they throw away, and how much information they keep here. And so these are all still 24 megapixels in size as far as resolution, but they compress that information and they'll throw away some of that tonal information in there. And with certain types of imagery in certain environments on computers and on the internet, for instance, you may not notice that information. But if you go back to try to develop, to make a print, to really get into the details of an image, you are throwing away some information in there. So these can be handy when you know you need kind of a basic level image out of the camera. And they have different compression options from basic to fine. And that little asterisk is kind of a second level of quality on top of the option that's already there. We then have the option of shooting RAW and JPEG at the same time. So every time you press the shutter release, you get two photos. Generally, I don't recommend this for most people unless you have a specific need for it. Because if you shoot RAW, you can make a JPEG later on. You can make JPEGs over and over and over again. If you're going to shoot RAW and JPEG, it's usually because you need the JPEGs right away for a convenience issue. Uh, perhaps maybe you're shooting an important event where you want to get great quality images, so you're shooting RAW, but somebody else, maybe you, maybe somebody else, needs JPEGs right away to do a slideshow or to upload to uh, a website right away. And you don't want to have to download all the RAWs, make JPEGs, and export them and so forth. That could be logistically very time consuming to do that. And so if you do have a special application, then yes, you can choose to shoot raw and then you can choose what exact JPEG fits your needs according to the sizes there. So recommend raw for most people on this. If you know a specific need, then either JPEG or raw plus JPEG to fit that specific need. So make sure you get that set right properly on the camera. That is going to be in the photo shooting menu. And so let's go ahead and actually take a look on that right now so that you can get this set up properly. Okay, so on our cameras, we're going to hit the menu button and we're going to go left so that we're on the tabs. And now we can go up to the camera setting. We're going to go to the right here and we want to come down and there's a few other things going on in here and we'll get to these eventually. We want to go to image quality and this is, I always find this a little strange with Nikon. They, they start off at JPEG. They don't have you shooting raw. And so I'm going to go to the right here and go straight in here. And there's a scroll and we're kind of down towards the bottom of the scroll. So I'm going to go up and you can see all the different raw plus JPEG options up on top. And the highest quality is on the top and the lowest quality is on the bottom as far as the JPEGs go. And then we'll have the NEF raw right in the middle. NEF stands for Nikon Electronic Format. That's Nikon's own proprietary RAW file type. Canon has their own, Fuji has their own, Sony has their own. Each of the companies kind of has their own unique file format. You need to have the right software in order to make that work. And so 
I think they may have the camera set to JPEG so that anyone can take photos and open them up right away, but I think that's a little bit of a disservice because you're not getting the most out of the camera possible when you're in that mode. And so having this set to the raw setting is where I'm going to set this up for right now. And you can see it says raw in there under image quality. All right, so once you get that set, you know you're ready for taking the highest quality images. And that covers us for the few camera basics. And next up, we're going to be getting into the really big sections of this class.